Good evening. Good evening. Y'all forgive me for being in my soft feet. I did a lot of walking today. My feet are killing me. But like most Kentucky folk, I did, I'm not used to wearing shoes when I was a child anyway. So it's, it's mighty good to be here tonight. You know, I've uh, got people that's coming here to listen to me talk. Now, I'm not used to that. When I was in the military, people had to listen to me talk because they were orders. When I was the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, I had a legislature that didn't want me to say anything. So this is a refreshing change. Well, I've been through a whole lot of things in my lifetime. Seen a lot of technology and a lot of technology came around here in 1913. We've got uh, the whole concept of entertainment changed with these flickers, moving pictures. I don't think it'll ever catch on. I understand over here in your opera house, they're, they're showing flickers over there. But uh, I don't know if it'll ever amount to anything or not. Uh, sit down because I've been on this world 90 years. First of next month, April the 1st, I'll be 91. They say that I am the only living survivor, surviving officer from the, the war the late unpleasantness. I am so far. So uh, that is, uh, I mean, quite a demand when we go to reunions, collecting the ribbons, we're, we're pack rats. We keep souvenirs, pictures, which I'll try to share with you. Uh, no, it's not proper to smoke anything, but this this pipe has been with me all the way through the war. I still puff on it. When I was politicking, I went to Mumfordville and my friends and neighbors didn't like what I had to say. So they started heckling me. I just sat down, puffed on the pipe till they hushed. And then I got to finish what I was going to say. But you know, I've seen a lot of things, a lot of inventions, airplanes. You know, people flying. Unbelievable. And uh, telephones that replaced the telegraph. Now, when I was governor, they put telephones in the governor's mansion and in the Capitol building. But I didn't use them unless I was forced to. I just don't think the government ought to be run by an invention. But uh, anyway, probably the biggest thing was the gas buggy. The horseless carriage, automobile, they call it. Uh, a couple of years ago, Delia said she wanted me to get an automobile. I said, well, I've been a lifetime riding horses. I said, I don't need an automobile. Them things are smelly, they're loud. You have to pay money to get them fixed all the time. And a good horse is much more dependable. I'm a fine judge of horse flesh. But she said, but Simon, you have been governor. You need to stay modern. You need to have an automobile. No, Delia, that doesn't matter. I like my horse. If we want to go a long way, we can catch a train. But Simon, well, what happened was we were having a disagreement like a lot of married folks do. We didn't have many, but we sure had one over this. So we decided we would compromise. You know, that's where one side gives in a little bit, the other side gives in a little bit, find something in the middle. So that's what we did. We compromised. I bought her an automobile. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, of course, all these inventions and technology, steamboats. Next, next month, April, it's an anniversary of the biggest, most luxurious, fastest 
steam liner, came from England, hit an iceberg and went to the bottom. And the newspapers are still talking about it. But 13 years ago, Delia and I took our son, Bolivar, for a tour of Europe. Yeah, we went over there and we went to all the countries and we listened to all the speeches and we visited all the sites. There's a picture made on top of the Eiffel Tower. We went over to Germany and there was a young guy who just took office named Kaiser Wilhelm. Now we heard him speak. And I told Bolivar, I said, that fellow's going to cause a lot of trouble someday. And here it is, 13 years later. And Europe's getting ready to blow up in a war. A war unlike anything that's ever been fought before. Kind of scary because Bolivar is a military man and he might be caught up in it. Well, anyway, we came home and I'm really glad that we did that in 1900 instead of 1912. Because... If we had been over there and sailed home in 1912, Delia would have insisted on coming back on the biggest, most luxurious, and the fastest steamship on the water. And I'm glad we wasn't on the Titanic. <laughs> well, I was born in Hart County, Kentucky. Eight miles from a little town called Mumfordville. That's a cabin that my father, Ailett, built. Well... He had slaves back in those days. Slaves built it. Now, I never believed in slavery. People wonder why I could fight for the Confederacy but not believe in slavery, but I didn't. Because my childhood, growing up around that house and in those woods, my only playmate was a young black man of my age named Shelbourne Matthews. Now, Shelbourne and I, we were road rats together. We hunted the forest. We fished in the creeks and the rivers and in the Green River. We skinny dipped in the reservoir right lake together. My father didn't like that much. But we grew up together, kids, and there just wasn't anything about slavery to it. We didn't even talk about it. We didn't even know it existed. We were friends. At nine years old, my father decided that I needed to go to Munfordville to attend the Munfordville <coughs> Seminary. So I jumped on the horse. Shelbourne jumped up behind me. He said, I'm going to. I is your bodyguard. <laughs> well, so Shelbourne went with me. And there we uh, stayed in the home of Thomas Wood. And uh, right behind the Wood house, was the seminary. A little one-room log house, wasn't big, but back then formal education was furnished by churches and, 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 and that sort of thing. So I went to the seminary. Well, Thomas and I went in there and took the classes. Shelbourne went with us and he sat down in the back leaning against the wall. It wasn't legal to give slaves an education. Everything we learned, Shelbourne learned. He became an educated man without a diploma. Later on, we moved over to Muhlenberg County. My father moved his iron works over there. He had an iron furnace. And he went over there and got a partner and built a big iron furnace. Eventually, it didn't work. So, uh, But anyway, we moved over there. When it reached 17, Shelbourne and I parted ways. And we didn't see each other for the next... 70 years. Well, I've got an appointment at West Point at the age of 17, the military academy. So from Greenville, I took the most direct route, which brought me right through Litchfield. I remember this house, the Jack Thomas house. Wasn't very many houses around the downtown in those days. And uh, we spent the night here. And then we went on to Louisville where I got on a steamer. And the steamship took me up to Pittsburgh. And from there we took a stagecoach for the rest of the way to West Point Military Academy. There I met a lot of people going to be my friends and some of them that would be my enemies. And I was more friendly with my enemies than I was with my friends. 
the city bus. Ones I got closest to would end up wearing blue in the late unpleasantness. I somehow didn't get along with other Confederates. One of my best friends was Ulysses Simpson Grant. He was my roommate at West Point. Now, his real name was Hiram Ulysses Grant. It wasn't Ulysses Simpson. When he enrolled at West Point, the custom was that you use your first name, your mother's maiden name, and then your last name. And that was the custom. So his mother's maiden name was Simpson, so he became Ulysses Simpson Grant. But he didn't think Simpson sounded very macho military. So he wouldn't tell anybody what the S stood for. Well, being 17 years old or so, you know, we'd give each other nicknames and hack on each other and we'd do that sort of thing. So we called him Sam. Which is nothing like what his name was. But he was Sam. We all had nicknames. And uh, Sam got drunk one night. That was one of his big drawbacks. He liked whiskey. And he liked puffing on his cigars. Later on, when Lincoln made him commander of all the Union forces, a critic said, Now, you know Grant's a drinking man. Now, I didn't have much respect for Lincoln. But he said something then that stuck with me. He said, Find out what brand of whiskey Grant drinks and give it to my other generals. He bites. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway... Uh, Sam did have his problems. I gave him a line of credit because they were going to lock him up if he didn't pay his bill. So I gave him a line of credit till his father in Ohio could wire him the money. Well, went to the Mexican War. And we all fought together. Classmates at West Point, Jeb Stewart, Albert Sidney Johnson, Ulysses S. Grant. <sighs> and... Uh, Ambrose Burnside, George B. McClellan. And uh, while we was down there, we had one general, or I had my first encounter with a fellow whose name was Gideon Pillow. Now, Gideon Pillow, he was a politician, military man. He wanted victories to make him look good so people would vote for him. So he argued with General Winfield Scott and I took the General Winfield Scott side of it against him. And Gideon started hating me from right then. Well, Mexican War was over, came back, got married to Mary, my first wife. And uh, about six years later, we decided that we had a daughter named Lily. Now, this was called the Glens. But when my daughter was born, it became Glen Lily. And uh, so we wanted to give her a stable life. So we set up shop in Louisville, and I resigned my commission in the Army after traveling all over to Army Post in Kansas and New York City and Chicago. Oh, we traveled all over. But we wanted to give Lily a good, stable life. So we settled in Louisville on Chestnut Street between Broadway and uh, though it's on 6th Street between Broadway and Chestnut, right in the downtown area. And there I took up business. I was always pretty lucky with business. I was, I've dealt in real estate. I've sold insurance. And I was editor of the Louisville Courier for a year. But that was after the war. So I've done many things. So I was always able to provide for my family. But back then, uh, about the time we moved to Louisville, this war had started. Fort Sumter was fired on. The South seceded. And Kentucky was right in the middle. A guy named Thomas Crittenden was our best friend. We were both put in command of the Kentucky militia called the State Guard. And... Uh, so we had chapters organized all over, most of them in western Kentucky. It seemed like western Kentucky was more akin to the south, and the, and the mountain people was more aligned with the north. But anyway, um, we commanded the state guard. Now then, Governor McGoffin wanted to be sure that Kentucky neutrality would remain. 
and be observed by both sides. So he sent me to Washington to confront President Lincoln. Well, Lincoln guaranteed me that he would observe Kentucky neutrality and not trespass in the bluegrass. Unless the Confederates did it. So I went back. The next thing I had to do was go to Tennessee and talk to Go Governor Harris and get the same guarantee from him that the Confederates would also observe Kentucky neutrality and not violate us just staying out of that war. When I got there, he had a general in the gallant uniform of the Confederacy with more gold braid than anybody deserved. Gideon Pillow. But he remembered me from Mexico. And he jumped in and tried to do the negotiating, but I ignored Gideon, and I talked to the governor. Well, Gideon even got madder at me, if that's possible. But I finally did get a guarantee that Kentucky neutrality would be observed. Before I got back to Frankfurt to report to Governor McCoffin, Lincoln had set up recruiting at Camp Dick Robinson in the Bluegrass. He had already withdrew the writ of habeas corpus and was arresting southern sympathizers, confiscating their property, dragging them through the streets and putting them in jail without charging them with a crime. Now, I thought that was a violation of constitutional rights. So when I saw my friends drug off and put in jail and losing their property without even being charged or put in a trial, I made up my mind that the South was fighting for independence against a tyrant government, and I agreed with the South. Now there it is. Later on, a reporter from, from Chicago came down when I was running for governor, and he said, How, why do you want to be governor of a state that you invaded twice with an army? I said, I didn't come here to invade it. I came to liberate Kentucky. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's what it was. And... Uh, so anyway, that, that, was, that was how she said. But I did go south, and when uh, Mary, Lily, and her little Henry, he died a year later. He just couldn't take the trip. But we went south to Bowling Green. As soon as I got out of Louisville, that hardware merchant, and uh, his name was William Belknap. Belknap. William Belknap and I had crossed paths and disagreed over many things, politics and business. And he led the way to have a price put on my head, declared me a traitor, and said, and made, said, had set so I would be hanged if I was ever caught. Well, I knew I had to be on the winning side or I couldn't come back to Kentucky. So we went down there and I was put in charge of Kentucky. The state guard became the first Kentucky Brigade later to be known as the Orphan Brigade because they fought for a cause that the state of Kentucky did not embrace. But they were the state guard. They were my people. And we, um, we organized the first Kentucky Brigade and they started going up toward Louisville and going west to Brownsville. And um, I suppose they came here too. But Mr. Lincoln organized a home guard, which was a pro-union militia. And he sent them all over the western counties, including Litchfield. But the southern sympathizers here would be punished and lose their property, courtesy of the, of the state guard, or of the home guard. Well, we didn't find any resistance. So, but before we got back, the Battle of Mill Springs was fought in Pulaski County. General Zollicoffer was killed. And Albert Sidney Johnson pulled us back out of Kentucky, down into Tennessee. Our new headquarters became Nashville. Well, on the Cumberland River, there was a fort which guarded from the riverboats coming down from the north, Fort Donaldson. And I was sent over there with a, re with a regiment of the 1st Kentucky Brigade to join in the defense of that fort. Well, I went over there. And there was two commanding officers over me. One was General Floyd. The next in command was Gideon Pillow. 
Well, he wasn't glad to see me. He Now he's my commanding officer, so I'm going to have to deal with him giving the orders now. He ordered me and the 1st Kentucky boys to go over to the right flank, the right end of the trenches protecting the fort. We went over there and we found out the Union commander was Sam Grant, <laughs> my roommate, best friend I ever had. Well, we charged out of the trenches and pushed them back for about a mile, and then we got a message from Gideon Pillow saying, fall back to your trenches. And we fought all day. And our men had died to gain that real estate. And now Pillow says, fall back. So I've got more reason to dislike Gideon Pillow. When we got back there, we had a council of war, and he said, you go there and demonstrate on the right flank. Because we have got to get out of here. General Floyd and myself, they'll hang us if they catch us because we're the most valuable men in the Confederacy. Boy, he had an overblown view of himself. So uh, we went over there and demonstrated while we was doing Pillow, Floyd, and most of the force got out by the only road open to Nashville. And by the time we got through and headed that way, Sam had closed the roads and we were trapped, outnumbered 10 to 1. Now to fight further would have been spending lives that would accomplish nothing. And I always put my men ahead first in importance. So I sent a message to Grant asking for the terms of surrender. He said no terms but unconditional surrender. That's pretty famous. Now U.S. is going to stand for something else. <laughs> well, we did meet with Grant and uh, I did surrender to him. And seems like that's what most people remember me for is surrendering. In that war, I surrendered twice. Once to Grant at Fort Donaldson and later in New Orleans. At the end of the war, I surrendered uh, one-third of the Confederate force. But I, I hope that someday people will look at me a little different than that. Because everything I did was for the good of my men. Well... We met with uh, on the riverboat after the official surrender took place and Grant and I was alone. We talked about a sermon together in West Point in Mexico. And I told him what General Pillow said about what would happen if he got captured. Sam started laughing. He says, well, if I'd have captured General Pillow, I'd have let him go because he's the best cause we have for the North. <laughs> Big bag of wind. Well, we had a big laugh about that, but I was put on a steamboat and I was taken to Boston. And in Boston Harbor, I was in prison in Fort Warren for five months. Now, early in that war, we had an exchange. If the South had a northern general, they would bring him. If the North had a southern general, they'd bring him and they would switch him out. They stopped that a little later on, but back then I got exchanged in five months of captivity, which was kind of like a country club, because I taught at West Point. And the commander of Fort Warren was one of my students. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't that bad. So we went back to Richmond, and Mary and Lily was waiting for me there. They followed me all the way through the war. We always made accommodations in a safe area so that I, I could be close to my family. When we got back, the Battle of Shiloh had been fought, and the 1st Kentucky Brigade had really made its mark and got famous. That's where they first started calling them orphans. And now, a new general was in charge of the South. Another fellow I didn't like. His name was Braxton Bragg. He didn't get along with me. He didn't get along with anybody. He could plan a battle, execute the battle, and then he'd order a retreat. That was just how Bragg did it. But he was a good friend of President Davis. So he stayed in command. Now he was planning an invasion of Kentucky. So I was put in charge of a division. And we came into Kentucky. General Buell, the Union commander, was coming up from Nashville right behind us. It was a race for Louisville because Louisville was a Union town. We got to Mumfordville and we found a Colonel Wilder had fortified the trestle there and the entrance to the town crossing the Green River. 
Well, the advanced forces made a charge against those works. Bragg had told them, said, don't open a battle until we get the whole army up. Well, he, he charged and did it anyway. Bragg got mad. He said, we're going to kill every one of them and burn the town. Well, I thought burning my hometown of Mumfordville would be a terrible idea. So I went to Bragg and I reasoned with him. Don't burn my town. If I can get them to surrender, will you not burn the town? So finally he calmed down and agreed. So I went and got Wilder out through a flag of truce. Told him that I wanted him to surrender. And he said, General Butler says, I know you. You are an instructor at West Point. And I respect what you think. What do you think I should do? <laughs> I thought I made that clear. I wanted him to surrender to me. So I said, I'll tell you what, you're, it's going to be your decision. So I took him up to the Confederate lines. We rode down by the Confederate lines. He counted our cannon. He counted our men. And then he said, yes, indeed, you outnumber us. So to save lives, I will surrender to you. Now, later on, some people said that I cheated. They said that I took these men after they were counted and moved them in line to be counted again. I wouldn't do anything like that. General Forrest might, but not me. <laughs> but that did save a lot of fight and a lot of lives. And from there, we went up there and... General Bragg ordered a march on Bardstown, allowing Buell to come on into Kentucky first. And for the next five months, or excuse me, the, the next month, we were running around the bluegrass trying to control the area. We actually went into Frankfurt and we were installing a, a Confederate governor of Kentucky in the capital. When Buell's artillery got on a hill overlooking the city and started lobbing cannonballs in there and disrupted the ceremony. Well, we bumped into each other at Perryville. Bragg had a good plan. I'll take the offensive. We pushed back on our left flank, we pushed on our right flank and pushed General Buell's army back for two miles. And then the sun went down. The battle only lasted one day. But you see, John Hunt Morgan had promised Bragg that Kentucky men would join the Southern Army if we invaded. So that's what he wanted to come to Kentucky for. It just didn't happen. <laughs> it just didn't happen. So, after the end of the fighting, Bragg ordered a retreat. We had won the battle! We had won! We argued with Bragg. We had won a victory. Our boys lie dead on that battlefield gaining this ground and you're going to order a retreat. He said, yes, but in the morning we'll be facing a brand new section of the army who wasn't in the battle. We argued with him. But it didn't do any good. He started to retreat. Now John Hunt Morgan knew that Bragg was mad at him because Kentucky men didn't join the colors. So John Hunt Morgan didn't retreat back down through Cumberland Gap. He went west. He came through Elizabethtown. When he got to Litchfield, the Battle of Litchfield was fought. Did you know there was a battle here? Battle of Litchfield fought right here in the Courthouse Square. John Hunt Morgan's men, over a thousand men on horseback, came riding into town. When they got there, there were six home guards from Lincoln's administration that was camped there in the courthouse. I mean, in the, in the lawn of the courthouse. Well, we got there and they quickly overpowered them, took them into the courthouse and put a guard on them. Now Morgan, all he wanted to do was just to stop Lincoln soldiers from harassing the good citizens of Grayson County. So he was in there talking to the guard and said, be sure you keep these alive because we're going to hang them in the morning. And then he took them out there and said, you just keep this going because that's what I want them to believe. And the next morning they got in there and those soldiers have been on their knees praying in the courthouse yeah, all night long. They've been writing out their wills, writing letters to their next of kin because they're going to be hanged in the morning in Litchfield. And Morgan got in there the next morning he said, we've reconsidered. We're going to let them go. And they said that those <laughs> old guys came over and kissed his feet. <laughs> 
because he didn't kill them. Well, that's the Battle of Litchfield. Now you know. <laughs> well, Morgan did go on back into Tennessee by way of Muhlenberg County. Well, after that, um, we retreated back into Tennessee, and I was sent to Mobile, Alabama to fortify that seaport to keep that, that harbor open for trade. And while I was there, Bragg fought the Battle of Stones River, or Murfreesboro. Same thing happened to happen to Perryville. The Confederates pushed the Union Army back against itself, defeated it, and Bragg ordered a retreat. The Kentucky soldiers, well, they, they said, no, said, we've won a battle. Let us try. So Bragg said, all right, we want you to take that right flank and charge those federal troops up on that hill. Well, they were up on a hill, all right, with a cliff, a wide river, and then a big open plain with every cannon that he had in his army on top of there. He didn't like Kentuckians. For some reason, he didn't like Kentuckians. So they made the charge, and about a third of them died on the charge. When they came back, General Breckinridge came out and met them. He said, my poor orphans, what has he done to you? pieces. From then on, 1st Kentucky proudly wore the name Morphin Brigade because they were, they died and every battle they were in, their commanding officer was killed. And they fought for a cause Kentucky did not embrace. Well, we got there, when I got back that battle was over, I missed Stones River and we were in Chattanooga and Bragg went down there, and then we had a new general, Rosecrans, took Buell's place. He came down, and with sheer negotiation, he tricked Bragg into retreating out of Chattanooga without firing a shot. And here we were in North Georgia. Well, over in the east, Lee's army was kind of tired of hearing about us getting beat over here in the west. So he said, uh, General Longstreet's Corps from the Army of Northern Virginia to go over and show us how to win a battle. Well, they came over. They got there about the time that the battle was opening up, just when the Union line kind of opened and left a gap in the middle, and Longstreet's Corps went charging through and rolled them up like a carpet. Clear-cut Confederate victory. Bragg did not believe he had won. He wouldn't let us pursue. We sent letters to President Davis demanding that he be replaced. Well, he stayed in command. And then, finally, when he agreed, he had divided the army up. Longstreet was sent to Knoxville. The rest of the Confederate army, victorious from Chickamauga, got up on the ridges overlooking the city of Chattanooga. The line was too thin to hold. And Grant's army, led by General Sherman, charged up the hill, and the Confederate army just fell apart. And from there, I was sent to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. There I was put in charge of the armies of the West. It was uh, about the last year of the war. Lee surrendered to Grant. Johnson surrendered to Sherman. And then all the force left was me. And I surrendered in New Orleans, Louisiana, the remaining Confederate forces. Now, I was such a well-known Kentuckian <laughs> They put it in my parole that I couldn't come back to Kentucky. Three years I stayed in New Orleans, and there I worked for newspapers, sold real estate, made a pretty good business of myself. And finally, at my insurance business for the Globe Insurance Company of New York City, I needed to travel. The business was spreading out, out of Louisiana. So I sent a letter to the War Department to get permission to leave Louisiana. Grant was president of the United States at that time, and he got the letter, and he did a proclamation. Simon Buckner could go anywhere he wants. So Lily, Mary, and I came back to Louisville. We found out Kentucky was kind of peculiar. They didn't join the, the Confederacy during the war, but once the lost cause was lost, everybody in Kentucky was pro-Confederate. A clear way of being elected to anything from dog catcher to mayor to governor, as I later proved, 
All you had to do was be a soldier of the Confederacy, and Kentucky would elect you. So Kentucky joined the Confederacy once it was all over. Well, we got back, and for the next 10 years, I worked on getting my property reacquired. My Hart County property, my Elizabethtown property, my Chicago property, and my Louisville property. And the lawyers? Ambrose Burnside, <laughs> Union General, that I had faced in battle was my lawyer. And he worked hard, and he got my property restored to me. Well... Ten years later, after doing this, we was uh, living in Elizabethtown. I maintained a home in Elizabethtown, Hart County, and Louisville. Hey, Mary passed away. And it was just me and Lily. I got my sister to come over from Arkansas. And we were going to rebuild Glen Lily. Oh, we got to work on it. and Then my sister passed. And then my daughter Lily, my precious little Lily, came to me with the words that no father or a daughter wants to hear. Father, I have seen a man who wants to marry me. Not wanting to break my little Lily's heart. I didn't object, but I said, well, I, what is the name of this fellow? She said, his name is Morris. Morris Belknap. <laughs> well, I had to ask, is there any relation to William Belknap? She said, oh, that's his father. Have you, do you know him? <laughs> Our paths have crossed. <laughs> well, I didn't want to break her heart, so I gave my permission for the marriage. It took place in Richmond, in us, excuse me, it took place in Louisville. All the pomp and circumstances to Morris Bellman. And that marriage gave me several grandchildren. One of my grandchildren took this picture on the Eiffel Tower, went with us to, to Europe. And um, so uh, here I was. She moved out and I was alone. Hey, Glenn, look. Sitting on the porch. And that's where I was born. That's where I grew up. So I sat on the porch, enjoying the peace, thinking that my life was pretty much over. I sat there and I watched the squirrels jumping in the trees. I watched the peacocks in the yard. I watched the rabbits hopping along and the squirrels jumping in the trees. Occasionally a deer would come up. Rabbits would come by, and, and I'd sit there and just watch, watch, watch. Silent. <laughs> you know, that's how we watch the squirrels jumping in the trees. <laughs> and it was, oh, and it, 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 I got lonesome. Now, I heard that over at White Sulphur Springs in West Virginia, they had a resort, one of those mineral water resorts where you drink that stinking water to cure everything from measles to bunions. They got one here in Grayson County. A couple of years ago, I stayed at the Morality Hotel down there in Grayson Springs, wonderful place. And um, so um, I went to West Virginia. There are all these veteran officers of the North and the South were meeting and in the lunchroom they were swapping tales and stories about meeting on battlefields. And I joined them. That's a good, a good way to get over the horror of the war. Now everybody gathered around and listened to our little discussions. But one lady in particular paid particular attention. When I was sitting out on the veranda, she would go out there and ask me more questions. And we got to see a lot of each other. Well, you know, people came to White Springs and stayed at that Greenbrier Hotel for many different reasons. Companionship, the sulfur water. Some of them went out there because of this game. Grown men playing games. Can you believe it? When I got back to Louisville after the war, I was on the commission for establishing the Kentucky Agricultural School. 
It goes by a different name now. You know what it is? Okay. University of Kentucky. And they, they haven't got games going into college. This, this guy named Matt Naismith invented a game where you take a volleyball and you throw it in a peach basket nailed to the... And now these schools are all organizing teams and trying to beat each other. Kentucky has been doing pretty good. But I don't think the game will ever amount to anything. <laughs> Kentucky will never be good at it. But anyway, down here we had this game at the Greenbrier Resort called golf. Silliest game I've ever heard of. Six words. Birdie. Putt. Tee. I, I, I never understood it. I was never into games. But there was one guy out there we know that went down there and he played that golf game at Greenbrier twice a day, morning and evening. And he never let anything interrupt his golf game. So he was up there getting ready to, to putt. Put the thing down there. Funeral procession came by and he stopped, took off his hat, about 15 seconds and put it back on. And the other guy said, hey, wait a minute. All the years of playing golf with you, I've never seen anything interrupt your game or distract you. What has happened? I said, well, I owed her that much. I was married to her 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Men do love their golf, but I don't think Greenbrier will ever amount to anything. It's just too big, too expensive. And I don't have much faith in the most sulfur water anyway. But anyway, this young girl named Delia, we spent a lot of time together, and eventually we agreed to marry. She was from the Confederate aristocracy, Richmond, Virginia, Edia Claiborne. And so uh, she agreed to become my wife. Here's our wedding picture. I was 63, she was 27. Fine judge man who the coach she was. <laughs> Well, we got married in Richmond, Virginia with all the trap and majesty of a formal wedding. And then we went on our wedding trip to New York State. When we got up there, we found out that Sam Grant had retired. He had received the surrender of Lee. He had been the President of the United States for two terms, eight years. But smoking cigars and whiskey had taken its toll and he had throat cancer. And he couldn't talk. So I sent a telegraph message and uh, asked his son, Fred, is your father receiving guests? He said, Father would be glad to see you. So Dee and I went to Mount McGregor. And there we found Grant sitting on the porch, much like he is in this photograph. I'm sure I'll get it back, so I'll pass that around. That's Grant on the porch at Mount McGregor. We sat out there and Delia went back and talked to his wife, Julia. And uh, Grant had to communicate by writing his questions and responses on a piece of paper. Did you tell him about uh, how this came into our position? Julia was one of the nicest ladies I think I've ever met, even though she was married to a union general and, and a president. As as Simon said, I was from the South, and we just didn't always get along. But Julia and I had tea together, and she was so nice. And after we left, she gathered up all of the papers that Simon had put together and, and wrote to, to the Ulysses and the ones that Ulysses had written to Simon. She gathered them all up and put them in this envelope, and she sent them to us as a remembrance. Well, now, as he says, we are pack rats. So we have kept everything. But here's copies of the letters that that's uh, the letters that the that's letters that uh, Ulysses wrote to Simon when he and I were on our way. People to are calling them the Grant notes. But we had a long talk and visit about 20 minutes, and then I saw that Sam was getting tired. So we got the Grant notes and we left. Then we came back to Harp County. And we set up housekeeping at Glen Lily. Then she announced to me, short time later, Simon, you're going to be a father. I said, Delia, don't you think I'm a little old for that? She said, apparently not, and it's too late now. 
Indeed, indeed you did have our son, Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr. He called him Bolivar. That's him right there at the age of 14 in Paris in 1900. Well, Delia is a social climber. While we were there, she had me build a swimming pool. Let me see a little corner of it there in that picture. Over there is a bottle that I made of the house. Pick it up there, Kelly, and turn it around. I built onto it in the back and all around it. And uh, I'm uh, that little model of it, I, I, I don't know where exactly it's going to go, but but anyway, that's a model I've built of uh, that house right there. Well, i got to do something. But anyway, uh, after Simon Jr. was born, Dee just turned up there and she got the aristocrat in or came out. Munfordville wanted me to run for senator. Well, I tested the waters, and I found out I didn't have enough support, so I withdrew. A little short time later, they asked me to run for governor. Now, this time I accepted it, and I barely won. But it was a victory, and I became the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky in 1887. Now, the four years in Frankfurt, I could have been reelected. But one of the reforms I did was term limits. I got it set so a governor would serve only one term. I'm trying to reverse it now. But that's why I was only governor for four years. But when I got there, Kentucky government was in a mess. We were in a financial chaos. We had a Kentucky treasurer who went by the name of Honest John Tate. Oh, that was a red flag. He had been state treasurer for 20 years. When the first day in there, I started looking at the books because I was a businessman. I thought a government ought to be running like a business. Who ever heard of such a businessman being elected as an executive? It never happened again. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I found out that our treasury was short $147,000.86. I called in Tate, and I said, we're going to have an audit. We're going to find out where that money is. I want you to be in my office first thing in the morning with the auditor. The next morning, I showed up. The auditor showed up. Tate didn't show up. He disappeared and was never heard from again, and so did $186,086. Well... I knew I was going to have to crack down and make up that deficit because for 20 years he's been shaving money out of the treasury. And he kept getting reelected. Well, uh, also something going on. I had a, a legislature that was padding every bill they sent through for benefits for their own districts or for themselves. I saw that and said, this is no way to run a government. So when they would get one of these things that I saw was partial, then I vetoed it. While I was governor, I vetoed 110 bills sent to my desk. More than any governor before or any governor after. A tool maker in Lexington, not Bill Lamp, actually made a hatchet, called it the veto hatchet. Had it engraved, but I never got it, never saw it, but I, I heard that he did one. So the legislature was hostile toward me for all my vetoes. Another thing going on in Kentucky was a bunch of Kentucky families in the mountains that just plain didn't get along. There was about six big feuds going on. Oh, there was one over at Moorhead between the Martins and, uh, and uh, I forget the other family name. Then down in uh, Middlesboro, there was another one in... Um, Hazard, there was one between the Eversol and the French families. Breathitt County, every family was fighting everybody. They called it Bloody Breathitt. Well, I had to deal with these problems. So I sent the militia into these places. And in two of the counties, I dissolved their county government. 
and said, this army is going to stay here and run the affairs. You go to the next county for your government business. But you stop this mess or you won't have a county. I wasn't sure I could do it, but I did it. And it worked. But you know the few that's most famous was the smallest of all of them. <coughs> it lasted 12 years, where the Breathitt feud lasted almost 100, a couple of generations. The other feuds lasted for hundreds of years. But in Pike County, Kentucky, we had a family in Kentucky called the McCoys, and across the Tug River in West Virginia, we had the Hatfield family. Now, nobody knows why they were fighting, but they certainly just didn't like each other. And they had been fighting now for about 10 years or so. Now, I promised the McCoys of Kentucky, said, if you let me governor, I will go to bat for you. So I was elected, so I did. I organized a special deputy to go there and cross into West Virginia, arrest the Hatfields that was killing McCoys, and drug them back kicking and screaming into Kentucky to stand trial. Well, the governor of West Virginia didn't like that much. So he sued me. And I sued him back. <laughs> now, this is why the Hatfield-McCoy feud is more famous than any of them. Because when it became a disagreement between states, and a court case, it went all the way to Washington to the Supreme Court over who has jurisdiction over the killers. Since most of the killings had taken place in Pike County, Kentucky, the Supreme Court ruled Kentucky has jurisdiction. West Virginia didn't like that decision much, but while this was going on, reporters from New York and Chicago and all those cities up north they came down and took pictures of our mountain folk sitting on the front porch with their coon dogs on the porch, wearing their bib overalls with their rifles and their corncob pipes. Corncob pipe wasn't such a bad thing. <laughs> and then they put them in their newspapers. And then the headlines up there called us something that we didn't take too kindly to. They called us hillbillies. Hillbillies! It's an insult. Well, they did it so much we began to say, well, yeah, we're hillbillies. But you know, the way it is now, we call each other hillbillies, but the Yankees better hush. <laughs> but that's what made this feud famous. It hit the newspapers. Well, we arrested the Hatfields, took them to Frankfurt, put them on trial sentenced them to life in prison, and one of them was hanged in Pikeville for the, for the attack on the McCoy cabin, and burning it to the ground and beating up the, the mother and uh, killing two of uh, uh, McCoy's daughters. So that, there had to be a hanging for that one. But essentially that ended the feud, it lasted 12 years. And uh, so I, I'm kind of proud that's one of my accomplishments that I put a close to the fighting of the feuds. Right before I left office, the legislature didn't want me to go out on a good note, so they passed a tax cut. Now, who doesn't like a tax cut? But the problem is, as a businessman, I said that a tax cut, we won't have enough money to operate the state of Kentucky for the next six months. I vetoed it. I vetoed it. And then the legislature overrode my veto, and the tax went into effect. And I was going to go out as a losing governor. So I sold my property in Chicago. It was right on the waterfront. I owned about two blocks. Most of it was destroyed in the big fire, but it was still prime property, and I sold it, and I got enough money out of it that I loaned it to the state of Kentucky so we could operate until I left. They never paid me back, but that's all right. My good name was preserved, and I was, I think I'm remembered well as a good governor. Well, four years was over, and one of the reforms was that Limit the governor's term to two term to, to one term, so I hung myself on being governor another four years. 
Another reform was schools. See, I went to the church school. I went to the seminary for my formal education. And I thought every child in Kentucky should have education. Free public education. And that doesn't mean black ch children and white children. That means all children. The way I set it up, that's the way it was going to be. The state would give them the money they need according to their needs to operate their schools, and then the local community would balance it with a local tax. But now, we got some reconstruction stuff on here that separated the schools according to race. And I just didn't like that much. Didn't like it at all. Because I thought a child was a child. But I started it off that way, but it certainly did change. Much to my dismay. Well, we came home and I was pretty well known. Running for governor, I traveled through every state. I came here and I spoke at your opera house. Wasn't very many people there, but I talked. But, uh, and I was, I was getting to be pretty well known. And now we have the presidential election of 18, let's see, what are the 97? And the Democrats had William Jennings Bryan running for president. The uh, Republicans had William McKinley, a veteran, a Union veteran of the war. And the issue was money. The Republicans wanted to stay on the gold standard. The gold standard for back up our money, solid gold. Well, the Democrats, they wanted silver certificates and notes. Now, as a businessman, I know that if you print twice as much money as you got gold to back it up, each dollar is going to be worth 50 cents. <laughs> it's not a good, solid economy. So a bunch of us Democrats didn't, didn't like the nominee. So we formed another Democrat party called the Gold Democrats. I ran for vice president. And a union general named John Palmer ran for president. There's a... I'll pass it around. There's a picture of us with a flag while we were campaigning. And um, so anyway, we ran and I traveled all over the country. In the south, we got booed because of Palmer. Went north and we got booed because I was southern. Well, all we accomplished to do it was split the party and McKinley got elected. Well, it went on and eventually McKinley was re-elected and his vice president was Teddy Roosevelt. Now, when I was governor, Theodore Roosevelt came to Frankfurt when I was governor. He was writing a book called The Winning of the West. And being that I taught history at West Point, he wanted to find out about Kentucky history, which I shared with him. Even though he was a Republican and I was a Democrat, we got along famously and hit it off real well. Later on, McKinley was assassinated and Teddy Roosevelt became president. And he was a different kind of president. <laughs> and he was a good friend. So Dee and I went to Washington and we visited with him. He remembered me well. And we had a nice visit. Well, from there we went back to Glen Lilly and my career was just about over. My military career and then my, my political career and now it's pretty well over, and we were sitting on the porch of Glen Lily once again, living out our lives. I go to reunions now. And every time you go to a reunion, they got these souvenir ribbons that you get as a participation. And I went to every Confederate reunion and Orphan Brigade reunion that I go, and I was usually one of the organizers or the speakers. And uh, so... Uh, uh, I got all these ribbons up here. I've got a lot of pictures. There's a picture of me walking in the parade in downtown Louisville. There's another reunion picture over there. But uh, that's what we do. Now, I spend most of my time. I go to Glenley. I always walk for exercise. But often I would walk the eight miles to Munfordville just to be social. I'm kind of slowing down now. I'm approaching 91. I don't think I'll do it much. People in town now call me the sage of Glen Lily or the, the white eagle of Glen Lily. That's okay. I was called worse when I was politicking. <laughs> well, 
I guess uh, that's about all I got to say. I got a reunion in Bowling Green of the Orphan Brigade. I'm supposed to be the main speaker, so I'm working on that. You have any questions for me? How did your first wife? She passed away. She passed away in Elizabethtown. She was buried there temporarily. Later on, uh, Lily had her body taken to Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville where she is making her life with Morris building up and raising her family. Any other questions about the feud or anything I mentioned? None? I guess I must have told it right. <laughs> is Glenn Lily, is it still standing? Well, somebody might answer that question in a minute. Oh. So if no more pictures from the governor, I will snap out of it and be done. Thank you very much. <laughs>